Hello everyone, I hope you all are doing well and you're safe. Uh, my name is Romaine Johnson and I'm an Associate Professor of Pediatric Otolaryngology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. I'm also the Medical Director of the Children's Health Airway Management Program in Dallas, Texas. And I'm going to talk to you about how to close a tracheocutaneous fistula. I don't have any disclosures or conflicts of interest. These are my opinions and it's not necessarily the best way to close a tracheotanes fistula because there is no best way. This is just the way that I've come to feel uh, to get, I can get the fistula closed in a manner which is uh, safe and consistent and reliable. So what are tracheotanes fistulas? They occur after tracheostomy decanulation. It's the persistent communication between the skin and the trachea it's a benign condition, but it can cause skin irritation and it can prevent the patient from swimming because technically there is a risk of drowning due to the communication to the trachea. The procedures to close tracheotanus fistulas are very straightforward. It's just a matter of finding the one that works for you. So I use a modified cotton technique. Uh, Dr. Cotton, uh, who's now retired, uh, used to remove the fistula tract, place a tracheostomy tube in, allow the patient to wake up, remove the tracheostomy tube, and then close the stomal site uh, with gauze and allow it to heal by secondary intention. I have a similar technique. The idea is that by doing it this way, you reduce the risk of subcutaneous air forming and pneumomediastina. Lots of people debate what's the best way to close the fistula. And I think in the end, again, you find what works best for you. So this is the Johnson way of closing a tracheotanus fistula. It's a loose closure that allows the wound to heal by secondary intention, very low risk of pneumomediastinum, low risk of a recurrence, slightly higher risk of needing a scar revision in the future. There are no real contraindications, but generally speaking, if someone's an anesthetic risk, it's better to wait till they're not an anesthetic risk. This is an elective procedure. And then you need to think about subglottic and tracheal stenosis. If the patient has stenosis, that fistula may be open because they're breathing through it. And if you close the fistula, you will increase the risk of airway obstruction and could potentially uh, cause the patient to rest. Um, you probably should get a sleep study or do some kind of follow-up evaluation if stenosis is present and you're worried that the patient is a borderline case. The advantage of my technique is that it's very straightforward. And again, low risk of major complications. If you have stenosis that's present, you just gotta be careful not to pinch the trachea with closure because you don't want to make the stenosis worse. You can have some minor complications like stridor and mild pain. Certainly the wound could open up a bit and it may take longer to heal, but healing by secondary intention is not a big issue. Here are some of the papers that I think you should read, uh, including Dr. Cotton's paper on secondary closure being the standard of care. Uh, these are the CPT codes that I use when I bill for the procedure. I use 31820, surgical closure, tracheostomy or fistula without plastic repair. For the most part, I'm not doing a lot of plastic repairs, although if you need to, you can bill for it. I always start with a bronchoscopy and I'll look at the airway just to make sure everything's okay. And particularly you wanna look at that old trach site and see if there's an A-frame deformity or tracheal stenosis. This is not a bad one. so. I thought the rest of the airway looked good, so let's just go ahead and take care of this tracheotaneous fistula. Uh, again, that A-frame deformity is key. Uh, so this is a typical fistula, it's a pretty small one. I'll inject with lidocaine 1% with Epi, 1 to 100,000 uh, around the uh, fistula. And then I'll draw a elliptical incision around the fistula. And uh, I usually stay pretty close to the fistula itself. I don't make a very wide incision. Uh, I'm going to stick very close to this uh, site. And then I use a 15 blade. And the skin is usually pretty tough. Uh, the tissue is very fibrous. So usually you have to put a little bit of pressure to, to get this surgery going. Uh, and what you'll find is that it doesn't bleed that much as long as you stay close to the fistula tract. 
it really doesn't bleed that much. And so I use this kind of cut scrape, cut scrape. So I'm scraping the fibrous tract and I'm cutting the attachments. I'll do this kind of circular move periodically to see where the skin is tethered. And here you can see the skin is tethered inferiorly. So again, cut, scrape, cut, scrape. And I'm scraping right along that fistula track. And if you do this technique, it bleeds very little. I rarely use the bogey for this surgery or the bipolar. It just goes so smoothly, minimum bleeding. And then once I get the fistula nice and isolated, then I will cut the fistula off. The key maneuver here is just don't cut cartilage. If you cut a big piece of cartilage, you gotta close the incision or the defect that you made, and you can potentially narrow the airway. So if you see cartilage, cheat a little bit superiorly, or superficially rather. And then once the fistula is out, um, I just use a simple interrupted uh, suture. I usually use a vicro. I will skim the very top of the trachea, just grab a little bit of that soft tissue on top of the trachea. I tend to bury my knots. Uh, and then I'll sometimes grab a little bit more soft tissue, superficial to the trachea, maybe a little bit of that strap muscle, if you can see it, maybe a little bit of that platysma muscle. Again, but I'm doing a very loose closure. I want air to be able to escape through the neck if the patient starts to cough and buck. And then once I feel like the skin can get close enough, I'll just do steri strips. And then that's it. Allow the patient to wake up. Surgery's over. If they get into trouble, take the steri strips off, let air escape, put the steri strips back on after they've calmed down and relaxed. Once the surgery is complete, I will admit my patients to the hospital for 23 hour observation. Some people do do same day discharge. I still don't do that. Uh, I think it's just habit. You probably could get away with same day discharge in many cases. However, I think you should do it at a facility where the patient can be admitted. Doing it at a surgery center seems uh, uh, risky. Uh, I do a four week post-op visit to, to check the wound. I used to do it in person, now I do a lot more telehealth visits. I can look at the neck with the telephone uh, and the family doesn't necessarily have to come in. If they have airway stenosis, then I'm going to see them again in 6 to 12 months and see how they're doing. And generally I'll wait 1 to 2 years before doing any kind of scar revision. I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please like the video and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you. Be safe.